Thank you very much, Adam. I am Mick Devin. Uh, my daytime job, I work for the University of Maine. I'm the hatchery manager there. It's an experimental, it's a full-size experimental shellfish hatchery at the Darling Marine Center. And I've been working in aquaculture research for the last two decades exclusively on um, invertebrates. I'm one of those guys that just says no to backbones and I'm fully focused on those animals without backbones. So I have a lot of trouble relating to animals with backbones, including Homo sapiens. <laughs> um, I also just got elected in my third term in the, in the legislature up in Maine. And uh, I have in the previous two terms, thank you, I'm actually a uh, blue oasis in my county back in um, Maine, it's Lincoln County, I'm a blue oasis in a sea of red. And um, I have uh, sat on the Marine Resources Committee and along with my colleague from York, Maine, who was uh, just elected to her second term, Lydia Bloom, will be leading a, uh, a workshop with some other legislators from New Hampshire, Maine, and some regulators looking to establish marine priorities in the Northeast from 2017 and beyond. And we'll be looking for your input as to what those, what those um, priorities should, should be. Mick, would you yes. be up for doing two sessions? Wait a second. Are we up for doing two sessions? Uh, well, we've got two slots. So you could do it in both slots in case somebody wants to go to a yep. different one. At She's saying yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's say yes. Okay. So um, the Maine coastline is, is under threat. And as we talk about the Maine coastline, if you take from the, east, the eastern seaboard from Florida up to Maine, which state has the longest coastline? That's a pretty easy question to answer, Maine. If you take Maine's coastline and you stretch it out, it's 3,500 miles long or more than the rest of the Atlantic eastern co coastline combined. Um, and we are very dependent upon our commercial fishing, uh, which is valued at over a billion dollars annually. And just to put things in perspective, the biennial budget of the state of Maine is six million. So to run the state annually is $3 billion, and our commercial fishing is, is worth in excess of a billion alone. Our aquaculture industry is uh, in trouble as a result of changes in the Gulf of Maine, uh, particularly ocean acidification, our recreational fisheries, our tourism, and then all those ancillary industries that go along with that, boat building, um, feed and bait suppliers, uh, commercial diving, on and on and on. So one of the, uh, orga one of the animals that we produce uh, in Maine is uh, urchins, I mean, excuse me, uh, oysters. Uh, we, we do it well. We have, a, we have a wild urchin fishery. We are working on urchin aquaculture, but it hasn't been commercialized yet. In 2013, I put in a bill, LD 1602, which was to establish an ocean acidification uh, commission. I'm actually, because of the time crunch, I'm going to try to slide through a little bit of these fairly quickly until we get to the, to the meat of the talk. The commission was made up of five legislators. I was one of the co-chairmen of that. There were two representatives from environmental groups. There were three commercial uh, fishermen or aquaculturists, three scientists, and then one representative from the Department of Marine Resources, the Department of Environmental Protection, and then the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Why did we have someone from ACF? Because our coastal programs falls under that department. I don't know why they fall under that department, but they do. Um, so there were six goals that the commission uh, identified, and that is for Maine's capacity to increase in monitoring, to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide, which is the big elephant in the room, identify and reduce point and non-point sources of pollution that are affecting acidification, increase Maine's capacity to mitigate, remediate, and adapt. That will be the crux of my talk here in a bit. To inform stakeholders, the public, and, and regulators in terms of education, and then finally maintain a sustained and coordinated focus on ocean acidification We've done that through the establishment of the Maine Ocean and Coastal Acidification Partnership. So now I'm going to talk about Maine's efforts to understand and mitigate co ocean and coastal acidification. I'll be talking about monitoring, buffering effects, and ecological approaches. First of all, monitoring. 
Until recently, believe it or not, Maine had no professional, governmental, or scientific organization that was monitoring the coast of Maine for acidification. We just were not doing it. We were not putting, we didn't have any pH meters or any way to monitor the amount of CO2 in the water along the coast. As incredible as that sounds, it's absolutely true. But now we've started a program that's being led by the University of Maine. We also have a citizen scientist uh, monitoring network. And finally, our shellfish hatcheries are doing some monitoring themselves. So a few years ago, the University of Maine, along with the University of New England, were awarded an EPSCOR grant from the National Science Foundation for about $20 million to develop Maine's aquaculture industry, an industry that, particularly on the shellfish side, is looked at as a way to uh, expand um, our, our fisheries and aquaculture, our, our marine economy, and do it in a way that would be very sustainable and, and um, not degrading to the environment. And I stress the shellfish side of that. Tom, in his last talk, talked about salmon aquaculture. That's a totally different beast. Um, here, um, about two years ago, through this EBSCOR grant, we were able to establish our, our CNET buoys, which are, which are operated by the state of Maine. There are three sets of them. They're called, CNET is a Sustainable Aquaculture, uh, uh, Ecological Aquaculture Network. And these buoys have been put out in three locations. The Maine coast is kind of broken up into southern Maine, which goes from Kittery to a little bit north of Portland. And then you're going from about Brunswick up to Ellsworth, which is known as the mid-coast region. And then from Ellsworth, Maine on up to um, the Canadian border, Ellsworth, excuse me, uh, uh, Lubeck in Eastport is known as Down East. And so a few of these buoys have been put into each major section of our, um, of our coastline. By no means is the coverage broad enough to monitor what is occurring. It's a start. It's something that we didn't have a couple of years ago. And hopefully, we'll continue to build upon this monitoring system. Um, second, we have a citizen scientist, scientist monitoring um, our coastal waters. It's called the Maine Coastal Observing Alliance. And it essentially goes from Casco Bay, which at the southern end of it, you find Portland, on up to Penobscot Bay, which is where the Penobscot River flows out. And you're talking about kind of the Bucksport, Verona Island, Searsport area, if you know the coast of Maine at all. And so it's the mid-coast area kind of spilling over into the southern coast area, also spilling up, getting close to the down east area. There are seven groups that are listed up here, and they have over 1,000 volunteers that are out collecting data. Unfortunately, up until about a year ago, you know what was happening? The, the uh, um, uh, Penobscot area people were collecting data, and they were doing a very good job about it. And then the Friends of Casco Bay, which have over 500 volunteers collecting data, were collecting similar types of data, but they were doing, using different protocols. And so we had one data set here. We had another data set there, a third one, a fourth one. They couldn't communicate. So what we've done is we've established this Maine Coastal Observing Alliance. All the volunteers are now util we're utilizing similar sensors, and the volunteers have been taught to use the same protocols, whether you're now collecting um, down in Portland or in my area of the state, say, Damascata or Bristol. And, and now, we're now we've got seven smaller data sets, but they can fit and they can mesh into one larger data set, which will ultimately be used by modelers to uh, help us with uh, um, how we may mitigate or, or adapt or use remediation to, to address acidification. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different steps that Maine is taking today, but there's really only one that is in active use. This is Bill Mook. He has Mook Sea Farms. It's on the Damascotta River in the small village of Walpole. 
I'm sorry, did someone say something? OK, I'm sorry, I was confused. Um, next to Bill is a woman named Meredith White. He's recently hired out of Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences, world renowned. Meredith actually sat, both Meredith and Bill sat on the Ocean Acidification Commission. Very bright people. Um, between them is a, is a uh, piece of gear developed by uh, Dr. Joe Salisbury at the University of New Hampshire. And Bill is using one of these to, um, to collect information in the Damascata River on pH, uh, the amount of CO2 in the water, and a whole series of other parameters. And what Bill does, he runs a shellfish hatchery. He supplies oyster seed from Maine all the way down around Florida through the Gulf of Mexico and over to Texas. Maine is very known for our hatcheries. We have, in terms of water quality, we have the highest water quality from here to Galveston, Texas. Consequently, we're, our work and the, and the seed shellfish that we um, produce are prized. In my world, on the research side, there is a con conglomerate of researchers that work from the Chesapeake up to the Gulf of Maine. The Darling Marine Center shellfish hatchery that I manage if, there, if there's a project in which we're going to put oysters, oyster seed out, say, in Maine, Massachusetts, and Cape Cod, and then down off the New Jersey coast and also in, in um, the Chesapeake Bay, guess where those oyster, seed oysters come from? Maine produces those. It's something that we're, we're very good at. So how is Bill addressing the ocean acidification that is already a, we're seeing in the Damascata River? The Damascata River. Is, is not one of our great rivers like the Andrew Scoggin or um, the Penobscot that has a, a huge watershed. The Damascata River is being fed from Damascata Lake. It's, it, is an ocean, it is an oceanic river. It's, it's totally flushed every six hours. And um, it has salinity in the range of 32 parts per thousand all the way up into Great Salt Bay, which is where Damascata uh, Lake spills out into. Um, so he is seeing decreased acidification. The hatchery I run just down the road, we're seeing increased acidification. When we have um, a large rainfall, we will have episodic events which dramatically change our water chemistry and quality. So Bill is monitoring that. And prior to coming to this conference, I asked Bill, you know, what are you doing? What can you tell me? He said, Mick, essentially what I'm doing is continuously buffering. And then when we have an episodic event resulting from large rainfall, he will actually shut down his uh, intakes and go into a recirculating mode. OK, switching over to buffering experiments. We've, uh, we've had a lab study done along with a, a little bit of field work. The lab study was done by Mark Green at St. Joseph's College. And what he found was that um, using shell hash, ground shell hash from clams, that it increased the survival of newly settled shellfish. So you have villagers, that bivalve larvae are called villagers. When they settle, they settle normally. They're about the size of two to 300 microns, which there are 1,000 microns in a millimeter. There are 1,000 millimeters in a meter. So there's a million microns in a meter. For those of you stuck in the English system, there's 25,400 microns in an inch. So these animals are quite small when they settle. And from that size up to about 1 to 2 microns in, in length, or a little under an order of magnitude, it appears as though shell hatch, shell hash does increase survival of these newly settled organisms. Once they get to that one to two millimeter size, it appears as though they're growing fast enough and precipitating shell at a greater rate than it can be dissolved relative to the pH um, levels that Mark Green studied in the lab. So that's, that's good. That's a good sign. Now let's talk about the field work. The field work was done by Dr. Brian Beal from the University of Maine in Machias, which is down east um, 
and he runs the Down East Institute. But this work was actually done in the northern end of Casco Bay, which I said earlier, the southern end is where you find Portland. This work was done up near in the um, Harpswell and Freeport area. So he looked at, he looked at using shell hash um, in two areas, or two ways, either plots that are 10 by 10 feet or in little potted plants that are filled with sediment and then dug into the sediment so that the top, the rim, the brim of the pot is equal with the sediment level. And, and the, uh, the circumference of, of the, those um, plant pots were in the range of 10 to 20 centimeters. So here's some shell hash that was used. Another photograph of the shell hash that was used in this experiment. This is Dr. Beal's uh, experimental design. He's got uh, six treatments and five replicates of each tr treatment. So you've got, you've got one set is no shell hatch in a plot, 13 pounds of shell hatch, or 26 pounds of shell hatch. And then the other three treatments were covered, they were protected with netting. Here is uh, Chad Coffin. He is the president of the Friends of uh, uh, the Main, the Friends of Maine Clammers. He's tossing shell hatch into a plot. Here's a plot that's got either uh, 13 or 26 pounds of shell hash on it. Um, and so, what did what did uh, Dr. Beal find? I'm not sure what happened there. It just did escape. Okay. So what what he found was that increased settlement and survival occurred in those treatments that were protected. And that there was no difference between whether there was shell hash or the low volume of shell hash or high volume. So the buffering did not seem to make a difference. It was the protection of the netting above. And in fact, an example of that netting would be, you see the, see the brown wooden boxes and that netting as well, that would be an example of protecting via, via netting. So he said, well, let's go ahead and this summer, let's go ahead and rerun that experiment and see if shell hash size makes a difference. And so he looked at three ranges, which were 10 to 20, 5 to 10, and 1 millimeter shell hash. He also took the Pacific oyster and ground that up to 1 millimeter side. So he had four treatments. Those were then also tested compared with um, uh, protection with netting. And he has not fully analyzed that data, but first go around through appears as though um, so, um, recruitment and survival was, is more dependent on the protection as opposed to the buffering. Obviously, more work has to be done because there's, there's a, you know, the, the lab work is telling us one thing, and the field is, is work is t telling us something different. Um, I'd like to talk now going on to um, the ecological side and utilizing marine macrophytes to mitigate the effects of acidification. And I'm going to talk a little bit about seagrass beds and then dive into some uh, kelp. And this will be done at the kind of 30,000 foot level. And I'll try to finish up here by uh, 11.30. So the, the idea with phytoremediation is that um, any sort of organism that is, um, is going through photosynthesis, whether it's a microalgae or the large uh, macroalgae, such as here there's a, a cartoon of sugar kelp in the center there hanging down. And you've got some rockweed in the middle. And then you've got eelgrass um, in the bottom right-hand corner. They are, are storing carbon. They're, they're fixing and storing carbon. So, and microalgae does that as well. Unfortunately, microalgae has a very, very short life span. And ends up, it'll absorb that CO2, it dies, it sinks down, and the CO2 and, uh, is released as it rots. That carbon is quickly released. And so microalgae is probably not the best use uh, through, through phytoremediation is probably not the best example of a way to store carbon. However, these larger organisms, plants are. And if we look at, um, there was an experiment done 
Um, it was led by uh, Dr. Nicole Price at uh, Bigelow Labs. She worked with a company called Oceans Approved. There's a picture of Paul Dobbins, one of the principals in the company. And they took some sensors, and once again, they worked down in Casco Bay, and they took some samples. So in terms of eelgrass, and I wish I had a pointer, but um, if you look, I'll kind of dive over on this side. This, this is Casco Bay. This is Portland down here. This area up here, this is Harpswell. You've got Brunswick and the Freeport area up here. So what, what are we looking at with this green? The green are existing, are existing eelgrass blades. The red are where eelgrass blades, we know they existed about 15 years ago. This work was done, this work, this particular study was done three years ago. And so in this area, Broad Cove, they brought the sensors in and uh, they went ahead and, and, and collected data. And then they went up to the Recompense Shores area of Casco Bay. So here are, are areas that at one point supported seagrass beds, but for one reason or another are no longer existed. And Adam, if you could just yep. push that yep. forward for me. Thank you very much. What they found in Broad Cove, um, the amount of dissolved oxygen had increased by 23%, and the pH actually increased by 12%. So seagrass blades and seagrass beds can affect water chemistry. And what animal lives in and around seagrass beds? Well, crabs, the green crabs, which we're not concerned about because they're invasive. Softshell clams is number one. Also, mussels, mussels settle on seagrass blades. They do not stay there. Once they get a little bit larger, they move on. But that's a critical life history phase of mussels. And if, so if the seagrass bed can improve water quality, we can, we can possibly see a bounce back of our mussels. Mussels used to be ubiquitous along the coast of Maine, and now we're struggling with them. We're struggling with them so much that one of the main projects I'm working on in the lab right now is developing commercial scale culture techniques so that we can supply mussel growers around the state. If we go to the next slide, please. All right. So this is a good friend of mine, Tola Fellers. He was working with, um, o with uh, Ocean Approved, um, growing uh, sugar kelp down uh, in, in Casco Bay, uh, a bit closer to, um, cl closer to Portland than what the seagrass um, bed study was done. So if we, uh, next slide please. What we found is they, they looked at inside the kelp farm and outside the kelp farm, they looked at water quality, and we're looking for what's known as the halo effect. So we're not expecting kelp be changing water quality a kilometer down the road. We're just looking in the vicinity of the kelp, the, the kelp forest, or in this case, the kelp farm itself. Um, so your green uh, data points are Inside the kelp farm, outside the kelp farm is black. Adam, if you'd move forward. And unfortunately, this is cut off, and I apologize for that. But what it found is there was a 13% improvement in pH. So we moved we, the water inside the kelp farm was more alkaline than the surrounding areas. And also, um, I think it's, can you read on? I think it's an increase in 22% of dissolved oxygen. You can't read it that. I'm pretty sure increased um, oxygen was about 22%. Both significant, statistically significant. So these are just the kelp. Uh, these are um, these are the start of kelp with what they, what they start out as. If we go to the next slide, we'll hold there. So kelp. What species could be grown with kelp? Mussels could be grown with kelp. Very good. Another one are oysters. Our oysters. Um, you know, most oysters are grown on the surface. You can at some point shrink them and I mean, sink them and grow them on the bottom. But, um, so, but you could raise oysters right inside the middle of a kelp farm. Water quality is improved. Thus, you're going to get uh, faster growing, healthier oysters. I think I can be over here from now on. But th thank you very much, Adam. This is a photograph of, uh, this is uh, Schuyler Bell. 
and her son Tor. Uh, they're working off of, of uh, Booth Bay. And I don't have much to report on this, but they have worked on an experiment where these are lines that actually have kelp that have kelp that have seeded onto these thin line, very thin lines. And what you do is you just stretch that out and the kelp, the kelp then grows off of it. This, um, the um, sewer system wastewater treatment plant in Booth Bay eventually feeds out into Booth Bay Harbor. And the question was, can you use kelp to further in, uh, improve the, um, the water quality coming out of, coming out of your uh, wastewater treatment plants? And I have not seen any data yet. I have, was at a, a recent MOCA meeting um, past Tuesday. This was talked about very briefly. Dr. Larry Mayer, who's a chemical oceanographer, world renowned uh, at the University of Maine and works at the Darling Center, same place where I'm employed with my daytime job, um, stated it looks like there's potential here and that just a rule of thumb of what people are throwing out there, and, and this is anecdotal, is that if you are going to look to improve the water quality of a waste of, um, of, of water of effluent coming from a wastewater treatment plant, that you would probably look to have a kelp forest that is roughly the same size as that area that the wastewater treatment plant is, is supporting. So if you're looking for a village that is one square kilometer, people are talking about developing kelp forests that are about a kilometer squared off of where that effluent is being fed into that marine environment. And I apologize, I don't have much more to say about that. I just wanted to make you, make you aware of something else that is, that is happening in Maine. So uh, the take home messages here are, um, Maine must increase monitoring to understand what is occurring and to provide a solid data set to create the models that we need to move forward. We're, we're not at that stage yet where we can create those models. Um, buffering shows potential in the, in the lab, but field trials to this date um, have not been successful. And the, and the potential for bioremediation, which should be at the bottom of this, and I'm not sure why it isn't, but, and, and bioremediation shows a lot of potential, both in terms of using it ecologically with, with seagrass beds, to using it in aquaculture with, with the farming of kelp combined with mussels and oysters, and also looking at, looking at water quality improvement coming, coming out of wastewater treatment. These are the folks that uh, have helped me put this together. They either did the research or were uh, um, I consulted with to create um, my talk for you today. I particularly want to um, mention all the people who are dedicated to understanding and addressing ocean acidification in the Gulf of Maine. And some of you people are sitting here today, and I want to thank you for the support that you've provided us thus far, and, I, and I'm sure that you'll continue to support us. And I'm going to leave you with one thought. <laughs> and I know you're laughing, but people do not come to the coast of Maine to eat a chicken sandwich. And in that one small statement, it says, we need to manage our fisheries. We need to protect our coastline. We need to protect everything about our marine economy. Because I'll tell you what, if we can't serve them oysters and clams and lobsters, they're going to go somewhere else. And that comes, that's true for Massachusetts. It's true for Rhode Island, New Hampshire, all of us. The tourists do not come to our coastlines to eat a chicken sandwich. Thank you very much. 30 minutes.